uh, colleagues, uh, we're going to move forward now. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome uh, Greg Perry, uh, who's known to most of us. Um, Greg is, of course, with International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Association. He's based in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, Greg, please uh, share some thoughts with us in terms of what lessons can be drawn from elsewhere. And I'm sure you will cover Europe in that uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Over to you. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Welcome. Right. It's a relief. Thank you very much. I really do apologize. I have no idea why my Zoom is causing problems, but I'm glad you can hear me. Um, I, yeah, I wanted just to raise a number of things first before um, getting straight into the issue of lessons learned. And, and I know that um, I've been asked here um, you know, partly because of my European uh, background um, and lessons learned from that. So first, let me introduce myself. So I, I am currently the um, uh, um, Assistant Director General of the IFPMA, which is, of course, the Global Organization for Innovative Companies. Before that, I was five years heading the Medicines Patent Pool, which was a, a UN um, supported agency to support access to medicines in developing countries, particularly around HIV, through patent sharing. And before that, which is important for this discussion, really, um, I was for over 13 years as Director General of the European Generic Medicines Association, where I was um, very much involved in, let's say, the establishment of the regulatory structures um, that now exist in the European Union. So, and I think a lot of that experience is maybe what may be quite relevant for, for today. What I just want to highlight, though, is from an IFPMA, and I know it's from a, a global in, um, pharmaceutical industry perspective, you know, there is a lot of full support for the establishment of the AMA. We have, we have developed a paper, um, which I believe, David, is circulating um, to participants. We also, together with a, a wide range of stakeholders, uh, in February launched a call to action for the ratification of the African Medicines Agency and then its operational um, feasibility. There was 52 signatories to that, uh, a, a wide area of stakeholders, NGOs, patient groups, generic and originator industry. And we ourselves have had, held several roundtables uh, including one recently at the AMREF Africa Health Conference um, in the support of the um, AMA. And we're also engaged with the patient, patient group uh, IAPO, International Association of Patient Organizations, in the establishment of what is called or will be called a MATA, which is the uh, African Medicines Agency um, uh, Treaty uh, um, uh, Alliance, which is going to be an alliance of a broad group of stakeholders um, to support uh, not just the ratification, but the operationability uh, of of AMA, and uh, we'll be happy to share more of that information through Pharma Connect as we go along. But having said that, let let me just go back to the main question that was set to to me about um, lessons learned, and the the clearest um, comparison to AMA is, of course, um, what we have in Europe. Um, which is actually a, a dual system uh, in many respects. The European Medicines Agency is a centralized agency. Uh, the authorizations which are made through the EMA are um, applied to every single country authorization uh, within the EU and go through a centralized approval system. However, just an important note, and I think this relates also to AMA, is that the network, that was established uh, to help in the assessments of those, of course, are networks of, of national regulatory experts from member state authorities. So there is a quite an important interlinkage. In addition to that centralized procedure, uh, which was um, compulsory from the beginning for a number of innovative products, but is now essentially being used by almost all innovative products and many generic products, especially biosimilars, well, biosimilars are not generic, but also biosimilar products uh, will go through the centralized procedure. There is what is known as the decentralized procedure, which was formerly known as the mutual recognition procedure, which is a system of recognition through 
um, member state authorities. That's very much still used by generic companies, also by the OTC industry, uh, as as well as some uh, new products uh, as well. So there is a dual system that is out there, and I just wanted to emphasize that. So I think, um, having said that it's the nearest similarity is the EMA and the uh, European structures, there are, of course, and it's been pointed out, that the AMA... Um, the, the African Medicines Agency will have some uh, more limited roles, let's say, than exists for the European Medicines Agency. But of course, um, in many respects, I, I think at this stage that does not matter because what is important is we having this step-by-step approach um, on the African uh, continent, uh, which is realistic and also uh, takes into account the importance, I think, of the regional authorities which have been established. And it uh, it was important to hear, of course, that, you know, these will be existing uh, and complementing one another. So coexisting and complementing one another. Now, this step-by-step approach is not uncommon, uh, even from the European side. So, as I mentioned before, within the EU, we had virtually a mutual recognition procedure, which was developed into decentralized procedure. it took time for the centralized procedure to, 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 to fall into place and to expand. Uh, it wasn't all products which first used the centralized procedure. Products were added as time went along. Um, it's also important to note a second aspect, which was during the establishment of these procedures, there was also a committee that was established to look at the differences of national requirements. And the role of that committee was first to make these national requirements transparent because one of the problems is you're operating in different countries and you didn't actually know what the differences were between them and you you, you learned a lot as you went along so one of the important things that came out from a european perspective was sit down and 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 be transparent about what your national requirements were and then once they were transparent to try and see how those could um, could be aligned, harmonized. Um, the transparency itself is important. The alignment or standardization or harmonization, the secondary part of that was of course important too. The third thing I, I'd like to talk about in this step-by-step approach, of course, is must remember that there was a significant expansion of the European Union um, when the new members of 10, as they were at the time, joined the European Union. These were mostly um, Central European countries, uh, together with Malta and Cyprus. And this is quite an important development in the EU, because these countries had to adapt to new EU legislation. But what was set up at the time was an organization called the Pan-European Regulatory Forum, called PERF. And this was a, a, a meeting, this was a, a platform where the new member states and what was called the old member states at the time, regulatory authorities sat down together and enabled the new member states, in a sense, uh, but it didn't exactly work like that, inform um, and assist the new member states uh, in the regulatory procedure. Actually, why I say it didn't work out exactly like that is because in the process, which was absolutely amazing, was that the existing member states also learned a lot about interpretation of the legislation, the differences between themselves. Which leads me to the point that it's so important that the uh, authorities, uh, the national regulatory authorities, sit down together, they learn from one another, they have open exchanges, and they're transparent. And as systems build up, Um, this functionality that will exist between the regulatory authorities will be the cornerstone of the success of uh, the, I believe, of the AMA and any continental or regional uh, aspects that work on that. So there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of informal discussions, a lot of um, structures that were set up in a step-by-step approach that led to what happened in the European system. It wasn't just the law. The law was hard law, not soft law. You know, it's legislation that had to be applied. But that's the paper. What really made these things possible was the ability of of people to sit down 
in a in a functional and step by step approach to make it happen. The second thing I wanted to to highlight was um, the importance of technical assistance and collaboration first between the authorities, and then I want to come on to the private sector. So the first thing was that there was um, uh, a lot of assistance from the larger uh, agencies to the smaller agencies, the more experienced and the less experienced. There were twinning arrangements between uh, new member states, or the other way around, well, between new member states and uh, existing member states when, when there was that expansion. Um, there was a lot of work sharing, uh, and all of these collaborative efforts were absolutely fundamental uh, for the system to work. The second part of that, I think, is the degree of consultation, uh, transparency, and openness that existed between the regulatory authorities and the industry. Um, and I think this was another fundamental part of the success of the system. Um, every, you know, everybody knew their red lines, but there was a clear, open, and transparent discussion. Industry were encouraged, were able to talk about where they felt the problems would lie, how systems could be improved. The regulators listened, um, they were open, um, and where they felt that it was appropriate in, in, you know, in, in the objective of, of, of uh, pu public safety and, and health um, would incorporate and work with the private sector in doing that. But as I said, there were clear red lines, uh, but we had many forums for that discussion. The forums there were, there were various committees that were established. We were invited as industry, all, all sectors of industry, I must emphasize, generic, innovative, OTC, um, whether it was uh, the big companies or through the federations, I have to say, um, were, um, were part of this dialogue. Uh, there were also a number of very important platforms like uh, the DIA meetings, the TOPRA meetings, all of these provided you know, great opportunities for uh, understanding and um, uh, uh, dialogue. And I really think that with, had that not happened, things would have been a lot different than, than, than they ended up doing. Uh, as part of that, um, um, what I'm talking about, both the private and the public sector, another, another, the third most important thing that I think developed from that was what I would call trust building. And that trust building, not just with the private sector, but I think more important, or just important, of course, was the trust that was built up between the agencies. Now, I, I've mentioned the step-by-step -step approaches, I've mentioned the various collaborations, but what really worked was the ability of, of, of the heads of agencies in particular, and their deputies in establishing what was then an informal structure called the heads of agencies, now formal structure, a heads of the agencies um, uh, meeting. And these helped ginormously in being able uh, to develop the decentralized procedure, but also I think it helped in, in, in developing the network, which was important for the centralized procedure. Um, and, uh, these, again, the heads of agencies, they would have their meetings, obviously, and then they would also open up later to, to, to industry groups. And I say, I stress, it wasn't directly the companies, it was the federations, that the companies would form part of delegations because they were the hands-on users. So, um, and th this 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 became a fundamental platform of being able to 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 move forward. Um, so I think you know there was a lot there that I've mentioned that I I think can be incorporated into the build-up of the AMA and when we start looking at the org organizational structure. But I think what I find interesting is that. Um, I'm talking about um, things which were happening almost 20 years ago when, when this all started in Europe and, 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 and Perth and, um, you know, working together on, on guidelines. But the interesting thing now, of course, is we are in a digital world. That wasn't the case then. And this is, I think, an important advantage. It's almost like a leapfrogging advantage that the AMA has is that um, there are so many digital platforms. And now, of course, um, one of the few good things that have come out of this awful pandemic has been um, the, the, the digital platforms are, have become the norm. 
they, they, and I believe most of us that are involved in all of this will believe that this will in many respects continue because it has created such an ability of efficiency and continuation of discussion that didn't exist. You know, when we were looking at this from, um, uh, when we were looking at this 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, we were having to have meetings. We actually had to have physical meetings. You had to fly to, you had to get to. Now all of this can be done um, uh, through uh, digital platforms. And there's a whole range of digital aspects and, and, and data retrieval and exchange, which I don't even know, which exist out there, which is going to enable the AMA and uh, its parallel organizations, which are already using it in the regional structures, to be able to move this along a lot more quickly and a lot more efficiently than has done. Having said that, one of course the disadvantage of the digital is is not actually meeting personally. And I and whilst on the one hand this will be very important, the need, the fundamental need for that trust building between people is going to be important. So whilst there's the leapfrogging, and that's great, um, I, I do emphasize also what will be important will be the establishment of proper relationships of trust between uh, uh, heads of agencies in particular and their staff and their staff um, at, at uh, the regional and the continental um, level. Um, I think um, I think the fact that uh, you know the the fact that there has been these strong regional bodies which have been uh, in each, each one of them sort of united in a sort of language and cultural similarities and uh, understanding I think provide. Um, something particularly unique and special for for the continent, and I think all of us are understanding that um, it's important that these these indeed continue, and that we are using these uh, more and more, and that these regional groups become stronger and act in complementary aspects with the AMA. So I think that is. Um, that is very important. I think that the other thing that I that is is clear to any to all of us that are operating on the continent is uh, is the degree of leadership that is now coming through. Um, and I'd be interested to see how how others feel on this um, through the African Union. And I think again from the COVID crisis, we've seen the amazing leadership that the African CDC has been playing. And if we can. If we can see that type of leadership mirrored within the AMA and the spirit and passion from a continental aspect as mirrored, I think that's also going to be very hard because, um, as was mentioned right at the very beginning, it's about political will. And if, you know, you know, where there's a political way that when there's a political will, there is a way. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it, that is something that I, that I think will play a very important point. I think the other thing uh, I just want to, to mention also um, of these, if I can say, um, advantages maybe the, that is happening now as opposed to what was the case maybe when Europe, when we were starting, is reliance as a concept is, is far better known, understood, uh, used. You can learn from other areas and of course it's being used on the continent uh, already uh, and I think that will be a key point. Um, the last thing I do want to say of course and, um, and was mentioned by the previous speaker and I, I'll finish now is basically financing and um, of course one of the things that we'll see with any agency or any uh, initiatives that exist it, it existed in Europe uh, as, as well is you know these were these were backed up by financing, you know, whether it was national financing of regulatory authorities directly or through fee structures or through the European Union or whatever. Let me just say the money was there and it was needed. And, it, and if it isn't going to be there um, and if we chose and we're going to have to rely, I understand, in the African context on national networks, but these are already under resourced. I think Having looked at everything, um, at the end of the day, um, yes, the political will, but it must be backed, um, you know, financially, and that's going to be a key important part of the organisational structure. I, I have not uh, 
followed, and I do not know enough about the details of the financial commitments that have been made. But I would just like to say that I think that that is going to be an absolutely fundamental part, of obviously, of making um, this work. I hope I haven't gone on too long, and I hope I've addressed the points that you were hoping me uh, to make. So I'm, I'm happy to, to be here for questions, yeah. Thank you so much, Greg. That was uh, absolutely great. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'll take two questions. Anybody with questions, please put them uh, on the chat and then I'll recognize you. Whilst that is happening, Greg, I note something that appears to be fundamentally different from an organ organizational structure point of view. Uh, the earlier presentation we had from Bakani, he indicated that the AMA, AMA is going to operate a decentralized structure. And that runs counter to the EMA approach. Is there something perhaps that you think um, warrants some consideration or reconsideration? Another point that you made is that the decisions that are made at EMA are binding to all the member countries, which is again, a, a point of uh, uh, divergence in terms of the approach that the AMA wants to take. How do you reconcile those? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I think we, I mean, we have to accept that, um, obviously, the European Union, um, not just today, but even 20 years ago when, when we were doing this, uh, starting off, um, is... Uh, you know, it, it, it is based on hard law. It, it, you know, it is an economic, political um, union um, with, uh, you know, a single market. Uh, and that means that its development as a regional organization, if we want to call it that, yeah, or as a, uh, a, 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 an inter-sovereign uh, organization, is more advanced than the African Union is at the moment. No one, you know, should pretend otherwise. It doesn't mean that the African Union isn't doing a great job. It is, but it's at a very different stage. And I think because of that, you can't mirror in the AMA what has happened at the EMA, because the legislative instruments to enable that to happen simply do not exist. Yeah. So, and that is a key a key part of the ability to have a centralized procedure at the EMA. You're going to have to have some very special um, treaty arrangement, international agreement between um, AU countries if you want to have a centralized procedure. Now, should a centralized procedure exist or not? I think there is certainly a case, if it was possible, uh, and um, at one point, because I think we, you might want uh, as, as a continent to look at, say, as the European U Union did for new innovative products. Um, you know, the, the, the assessment takes once at the African Union e uh, AMA uh, uh, assessment, and then um, it, it, it's applied to the member state uh, to the, yeah, the member states of the African Union. You could have a sort of a bridging uh, aspect in which it's a sort of a, um, a sort of a collaborative procedure mechanism. Uh, you could, uh, a reliance mechanism. So that's how you could probably bridge that legislative gap. But I think there is definitely a case for having uh, some parts of that. Uh, another thing, of course, is is vaccines. If uh, And we all know the great push now, um, certainly in the medium and long term, it's, it's going to be part of uh, the African uh, um, uh, health agenda to produce products uh, locally on the continent. This is going to require a totally new um, area of regulatory um, um, capacity uh, and skill sets uh, to look at vaccines. Maybe, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm just putting this out there. Yeah? It's, it's not a position of IFPMA, it's just a discussion point. Maybe there is a case that, you know, the vaccine authorizations of these locally produced products could go through a, um, uh, an AMA procedure. So um, on the one hand, what I'm saying is that there isn't the legislative, as it is, capacity to do that. And that's understandable why it's not. And therefore, it's a decentralized approach. Uh, what I'm saying is, having said that, there is a case for it. And I think the third point I want to make is that, as I said right at the beginning, 
there is a step-by-step approach. Uh, it's fundamentally important that the AMA gets itself up and running, doing what it's supposed to be doing now and using that decentralized approach and working together with the regional groups. Um, but I think for, you know, for a longer term, it's definitely, you know, definitely work, needs to be looked at, but it's how you get there that I think will require um, um, a, a lot of imagination and a, a lot of um, need to set up structures that are supported by everything. And at the end of the day, it, it will be based on some form of reliance. Yeah. Does that help? It certainly does, Craig. Um, I had committed to two questions. Um, I will ask one last question. Uh, at practical level, with resource constraints in mind, uh, amongst the different countries, how does it work in terms of bargaining? You mentioned the issue of uh, countries having to be transparent about their national requirements uh, at a point where standards need to be agreed upon that will apply uniformly. But how does that, uh, at practical level, you know, pan out, considering that the, the, there isn't necessarily an equality of arms amongst different countries? So those that uh, possibly have vast resources may want standards that are possibly quite high, that may not be uh, attainable for countries with less resources. How does that work out? How, 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 do, how do they bargain to arrive at a happy medium, if I were to say that? Well, again, in relation to the European uh, uh, aspects, I think, again, it was, um, it, there is a difference. I think, okay, the, the new member states as they were and the existing member states, they were, there was a gap uh, between them. Um, but uh, the, um, the gap was, well, okay, there's a gap between them. There's also, I think, a gap between some of the existing member states, larger authorities and some of the others as well. Uh, and I think they work together to build, to, to reduce that gap. Having said that, it must be remembered that the new member states also had, relative, in a lot of countries, relatively well-resourced authorities as well. So um, I, I'm not sure that it, it completely compares to the current situation uh, on the continent. And I think the specific issue that I was trying to, to raise at the beginning was not so much about resource and, and, and ability to, to, to assess when I was talking about these uh, national requirements. Uh, what happened there was it was just um, the agreement between the authorities to be very transparent about what their requirements were and to work together to see how they could reduce the differences between those requirements. But I think what we do have on the continent in Africa is obviously um, a limited capacity for an, a number of these um, authorities to operate. And that I think uh, requires, if I can put it, it's the right, I'm not sure this is the right word, sort of special attention, uh, whether we're going for an AMA, whether we have the regional hubs or whatever, uh, there, there, is, there is a need to look at that uh, and to get these uh, authorities and the WHO doing you know, this, the, the job of, uh, of assessing and, uh, and trying to upgrade these authorities. So that will be an important step too. So there is, a, I think there are a number of maybe different, um, different balls in the air that are happening than, than was in the case uh, in Europe, but again, some, some similarities. Again, I... Uh, this is my personal view, but and, uh, but I hope again I've been able to um, answer your question. Absolutely, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you for your time.